information and uh, support that state archives receive from NARA. So thank you for being here as a moderator. And on behalf of all the state archives, thank you for what NARA does for us. We love working with COSA, so thank you very much for, for letting us do this with you. Um, so welcome everyone to this joint NARA COSA webinar on the preservation of audiovisual materials. Today's program will feature two presentations, one from NARA and one from the Pennsylvania State Archives with two speakers. Each will be roughly 25 minutes, which will leave us time for a few minutes of questions and answers for all the speakers at the very end before our wrap up and just a few announcements at the very end. So I'm your moderator, as Barbara, as Barbara said, I'm Meg Phillips, External Affairs Liaison for the National Archives, and let me quickly give you some information about our featured speakers today. Dan Rooney is the Director of NARA's Special Media Records Division. Dan received his Bachelor of Arts from Loyola University, Chicago, and his Master's of Library Science from Catholic University. He's worked at the National Archives in increasingly responsible roles since he first joined NARA in 2002 as an archives technician in the still picture branch. He currently represents NARA on the National Recording Preservation Board and the Association of Moving Image Archivists. Our next speaker is Wesley Decker, Wes, who is an archivist at the Pennsylvania State Archives. His work centers on processing older media formats for both audio and video. He has a master's in library science with an archival studies concentration from Drexel University and an MA in applied history from Shippensburg University. And our next Pennsylvania State Archives speaker is Marie Valigorski, who is also an archivist at the Pennsylvania State Archives. Her work focuses on born digital governor's records and the digitization and processing of analog audio and video media. She's a Bachelor of Music and Music Technology with a concentration in sound recording and music composition from Duquesne University. She also has an MFA in Humanities and Music from Bennington Co College. She's currently taking classes in pursuit of SAA's Digital Archives Specialist certificate, um, Certification. So with that short introduction, let me turn the, the floor over to Dan Rooney. Take it away, Dan. Good afternoon, and thank you uh, very much, Meg, for the introduction and uh, to the Council for inviting me and Nara to participate in today's session. Um, as Meg stated, I'm Dan Rooney, and I'm the director of Nara's uh, Special Media Records Division. I'm relatively new to that role, but prior to that, I was the branch chief of Nara's Moving Image and Sound Branch for uh, nearly 10 years. So today's topic of preservation and access uh, to uh, to audiovisual holdings is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm going to be uh, sharing with you a brief overview of access and preservation practices here at NARA uh, with respect to these specific collections, and hopefully to uh, shed some light on how digitization has become the common focal point, really, for both areas, and uh, also how we collaborate across different NARA offices to achieve our goals. For any of those of you who are unfamiliar with NARA, uh, this slide shows you a few key background points on sort of who we are and what we do, but um, I, I suspect most of you are familiar with these points already, so I won't spend too much time here. Uh, the key takeaway is that NARA's primary mission is to preserve and make available the permanently valuable records of federal government. So if you're not as familiar with NARA's holdings, this point uh, should orient you somewhat. Uh, you know, NARA's audiovisual collections are uh, primarily materials that were accessioned from federal government agencies. So if you can associate imagery with uh, that you're searching for with a federal government activity or agency, it's very possible that NARA holds some relevant materials for your research project. Um, I think disappeared here for the slide. There we go. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, that being said, uh, collection of these types of uh, audiovisual records uh, does date back to NARA's establishment in 1934. And in addition to federal records, the branch also does hold a relatively large group of donated materials, uh, which are heavy on newsreel collections and radio broadcast collections, for example as well as other areas of collecting, which uh, generally were not well documented by the federal agencies themselves. So collections have been taken in that sort of filled gaps in NARA's uh, holdings from the agencies themselves over the years. Uh, 
Um, the numbers that you see on the on this slide here represent uh, the latest physical holdings numbers from our tracking databases that we have. And the collection is growing every year, so uh, this is just to give you a sense of the size and the scope of the holdings. And those holdings exist in most formats that you can think of if you are uh, familiar with audiovisual collections or if you're steeped in 19th and 20th century analog recording technologies. Uh, like most major audiovisual collections, we divide into three main categories, motion picture film, video recordings and sound recordings, and then further categorize below there um, at the physical format level, and we track by those formats. Uh, the most prominent of which you see are displayed here on this slide. If you can think of any type of audiovisual format, we probably have it represented somewhere in NARA's holdings, and some are much more dominant than others in terms of volume which ultimately factors into how we plan activities such as preservation projects, equipment maintenance and purchases, and contracts for public reproduction requests, just as a few examples. Access to these holdings happens on several levels, and historically, the most notable of those levels is through our on-site research room. Uh, though arguably that paradigm has been shifting for quite some time and certainly more so in the last several years. So we operate the public research room here in College Park, which includes a uh, service of a variety of types of formats that you see listed here, both analog and digital. Uh, one thing that makes this research room unique, even from other NARA research rooms, is the fact that we do not serve the original records. Uh, we serve reference copies. This is a preservation mechanism due to the machine dependence and the fragility of the original materials. Between 2010 and 2018, um, the branch prioritized a major transition away from what we were calling an analog reference service model towards a digital reference service model. This included uh, pro uh, mass digitization, of analog reference materials, and in some cases going back to the source materials, in order that we could then retire aging and failing copies of large collections and to stand up digital surrogates in their place. Uh, this was completed through an annual review and prioritization of different record groups and series to focus on, um, and it involved perfecting and creating appropriate metadata and project tracking for each group. And as the files were created and QC, uh, we pushed the files out for public access and then typically created buffer periods of about six months uh, to observe the use of the files and to note any additional problems before retiring the older copies from the self-service shell in the research room. This phase also included standing up local infrastructure for file storage and delivery to NARA's on-site researchers which we now have via public access computer terminals in the research room. Uh, to date, we have stood up approximately 43,000 digital reference files for public access, uh, typically digitized at the real level. So you can roughly equate that with the number of reels digitized that we're now serving uh, digitally. We, we are continuing to periodically upload new content to the National Archives Catalog, which is really the longer term access strategy for as much of this material as possible. So we're seeing the current um, on-site model as sort of a bridge to the catalog, if you will. Uh, some digitized content will, however, likely only persist in an on-site manner due to rights issues or other issues preventing NAR from posting the files online. This slide gives you a visual of uh, what some of those uh, of what those public access terminals look like in the research room where we're serving digitized content. And if you've visited our research room, you would have noticed some big physical changes that occurred in the summer of 2019, in which we removed the large bank of movable shelving that ran straight down the center aisle of the room. So that was a huge change for us. Um, and since I know that file stacks are always a very popular question. I've provided those specs here that we are typically serving. Um, I'm not going to go through those in, in detail, but, um, but this shows you what NARA is serving for both digital audio and digital video formats. Um, and if you do have questions about these, this is uh, 
topic that I love personally engaging on, so I'm happy to uh, don't hesitate to reach out um, or ask questions at the end of the session if you have specific questions about the file formats. I mentioned at the outset that digitization has really become uh, the driving factor for how we think about access and preservation of the holdings. And I wanted to use this visual here to sort of demonstrate what all the sources of input are that we're typically dealing with to plan our activities. And this is also sort of a nice segue uh, between talking to you about uh, the work that the archival unit staff here at NARA performs and the work that the preservation lab staff performs. So as you can see here, there are uh, a variety of triggers, so to speak, for digitization, how digitization activity comes about at NARA, um, almost all of them stemming from either an access or a preservation need. Individual requests can be ad hoc and on demand, such as the case with some of these you see here, like researcher requests or federal agency requests, uh, or their planned projects. And both of these types of requests sort of feed into our annual work planning process. And um, in that center box there, you can see all of the different uh, associated activities um, that get assigned out to individual staff members to work on for specific projects or specific groups of materials. For the most part, um, aside from textual record scanning and index card scanning and finding aid projects and scanning, um, which uh, which happens um, either systematically or as needed for a certain project. The actual digitization work of the audiovisual materials themselves uh, largely occurs in NARA's motion picture and audio preservation labs. The most common and time sensitive tasks that the preservation lab teams perform is to complete reference digitization requests. Uh, these are requests that typically originate from the research room, from a researcher, or from another NARA staff member that may need the copy for uh, some other reference or archival description or processing project that they're working on. Um, so this makes this makes up most of the non-planned work that we allocate staff hours towards each year, and the bulk of these requests are for scans of motion picture film. And we typically turn around these requests in two to four weeks, depending on our workload and uh, whether or not there are any condition issues present with the specific materials uh, that someone has asked for, which can, which can prolong things. Outside of the reference requests, uh, this, the lab staff work on systematic preservation projects. These are projects that are identified each year on the annual work plan, and some are recurring for a large series of holdings. And they may be designated as a multi-year project, depending on the circumstances and the types of work involved. Typically, these projects are driven by the needs of the holdings and are intended to mitigate any preservation risks that have been identified. And um, we take factors into account, which I'm sure some of you are doing all the time with your own collections that you'll be familiar with. But these factors include uh, the condition of the holdings, if there are any known risks or deterioration issues associated with certain formats, the availability of playback equipment and or budgets for support contracts that we may have in any given year. Um, and these individuals, they become individual projects that are then planned as collaborative efforts uh, between the archival unit and the preservation lab teams. Um, these project plans would typically include the goals, you know, the overall goal, what is our goal for this project? Uh, what are the metadata components involved? You know, are we are we able to leverage any existing metadata? Do we have to create from scratch? Are we converting legacy finding aids? That sort of those sorts of questions all happen sort of at the outset. Um, and as well, in addition to that, uh, you know, we're looking at storage components, what are the longer term storage capacities that we have available to support the project? Um, what types of file derivatives are going to be needed? Uh, what types of troubleshooting activities are we likely to run into if the whole things are, let's say, lesser processed or lesser well-described or well-known materials? Um, are we going to run into those kinds of issues which we need to devote extra time towards? Um, and in addition to all of that, we have typically identification of a project lead, somebody that's sort of assigned to see it through from start to finish, and um, be a liaison between those two staffs 
um, and ultimately to get the files to uh, where they need to go, whether that's in preservation repository or in the online catalog in the research room or all of the above. We also work on systematic access projects um, and in a very similar manner. Uh, these projects are developed each year as collaborative efforts between the ARCOL unit and the lab staff. These projects are not necessarily driven by mitigated, mitigating preservation risks to holdings, but rather by NARA's need and desire to increase or improve public access to specific groups of materials. Um, however, sometimes they can really be a mix of both of those things. Uh, for instance, if we have a compelling need for a new reference format because a certain item or a series of holdings is getting requested over and over again, and it behooves NARA and benefits the public to have the content as accessible as possible, then we will look towards uh, perhaps a systematic digitization project to address the issue. Um, the reference room migration project that I, you know, spoke of earlier is a very good example of that. Um, we needed to keep popular collections accessible and expand access while kind of simultaneously working on solving format and playback uh, equipment-driven problems. A secondary example of these systematic access projects are digitization partnerships, something that you know, NARA has been engaged with for many years, but I would say only in more recent years has this um, sort of trickled down to to us in the in the moving image and sound branch. Um, and we have uh, taken on more of these uh, activities in, in recent times. The partnerships are, are typically considered when an outside entity may propose some resources that could be brought to bear for a certain group of holdings that they have they may have an interest in digitizing. And NARA likewise sees some public access benefit that could occur as a result. Um, sometimes it works the other way around. Sometimes NARA has an idea about materials that they really want to improve access for. And we, you know, we may um, see if there are any partners that are, you know, suitable for, for the project. Um, and sometimes these can be holdings that, uh, you know, otherwise would not have been prioritized. Uh, and sometimes they allow NARA to greatly benefit from money or technology or efficiencies that we cannot typically gain ourselves. So these proposals, you know, they come to us in different ways. Um, some are narrow, some are broad, but they're all considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is an area where we've really uh, kind of increased activity in recent years. In almost all of these scenarios that I've that I've talked about, um, the lab staff will develop plans for the digitization work based on available equipment uh, and determines necessary file deliverables in consultation with the ARCOL unit. Um, the next several slides here offer uh, the detailed file stacks uh, at the preservation level that NARA adheres to currently and the typical derivatives that are common for each record type. So. Again, we don't need to review these in, in great detail, but I wanted to make sure that this information was out there for your review. Uh, it's also posted on NARA's website, so I'm happy to provide a link if uh, folks are interested. Um, but the three categories that I described earlier, motion picture, film, video, and audio, each of those are represented here. Um, with film, it's, uh, you know, DPX is the preservation standard. With digital audio, it is broadcast wave. And digital video is currently uncompressed AVI. In this last slide here, I wanted to provide an example of one such systematic access project that we have uh, recently completed. This is a five-year project that we engaged in to digitize Army Signal Corps, uh, the historical World War I film collection, which as of very recently, I'm pleased to say, is now 100% available online in NARA's catalog. So in the course of this project, uh, NARA staff inspected, prepped, and scanned over 800 reels of 35 millimeter film from the collection, as well as uh, the associated Army production files, which have now also been added to the catalog. As the icing on the cake, uh, during the past few months of telework for our staff, as we were finishing this project, it provided a great opportunity to do some enhanced processing on these records 
So we have had uh, groups of staff uh, going in and interacting with the online catalog to transcribe word for word the uh, all of the pages of the production files that are available in the catalog. Um, which uh, you know the goal there is to significantly expand the search functionality and uh, and uh, improve access ultimately to the collection. As many of you probably know, uh, with different types of uh, scanning of legacy materials and um, uh, OCRing and other activities associated with increasing search functionality, the quality and the and the and the uh, functionality that that offers can vary greatly depending on what types of source materials you're starting with, the quality of the scan, um, you know, the original typeset, and, and all that. Uh, there, there are many factors that go into it. Um, and these particular production files had very detailed shot lists that the, for the films that the Army had created um, in the 1930s. And we, uh, so as I said, we've had staff transcribing word for word. It's been a great, you know, telework activity for them to engage in. Um, those transcriptions are now all uh, live in the catalog. Um, we are QCing those transcriptions now, but they are out there. Uh, so it's all searchable, and we're excited to have that collection available in its entirety. I should also mention the great work of the NARA Volunteer Office in helping us scan those textual records. Uh, that was also a project that was done uh, over the course of uh, about a year-ish, I believe, to finish the scanning of the textual files. And um, it's, a, it's a great complement to the film. And it's a great way to bring all of the um, all of the content together for the researcher. It's one of the first examples of a large-scale film collection that NARA has been able to um, make available and whole. And it's actually kind of um, interesting because back in the, um, in the 1980s, in the first days of offering analog surrogates for uh, motion picture film research, this was one of the first collections that NARA had systematically transferred to, at the time it was three quarter inch pneumatic videotape. So we had the collection available in the research room for many years on three quarter inch tape. And now it's exciting that this is one of the first collections that is going to be you know, widely available in digital form. And they are uh, lovely new film scans. So I commend all the staff that worked on that project. And I invite you to uh, take a look at that. This is a live, Link. I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go out to the NARA catalog, but I assume we'll be distributing these slides afterwards. And there is a link here to all the item level catalog descriptions where you can view both uh, the digital the digitized films as well as the uh, digitized production files. And I wanted to just take a brief minute to uh, plug some of our online resources. We have a very, uh, we, we, another great telework project that our staff has been working on is um, revising some of our uh, older web pages that were badly in need of revision. So we have a first uh, crack at that, actually for more than just the moving image and recorded sound branch, we're doing that for all the branches of my division. So the still photography collection as well as the cartographic collection. And staff have been actively working on those for the past several months. Uh, all of those uh, first cuts at those web, new revised websites have now been launched and they're live. And here's a link to the moving image and recorded sound website. So I invite you to check that out. Uh, the unwritten record blog is um, something that our staff is, is very engaged in as well. They are constantly um, writing posts, highlighting different NARA content, highlighting newly available digitized collections, in some cases doing some deep dives into um, films and uh, individual records, and as well as developing research guides, which has been um, really great for all the remote research that has had to happen uh, during telework. It has sort of spurred us into um, some new motivation to get some really up-to-date information out there about online resources. So I definitely encourage you to check out the blog. Of course, the NARA online catalog, as well as the National Archives YouTube channel. I neglected to put that link in here. But we are also serving the uh, fruits of a lot of the Moving Image Digitization Projects on the National Archives YouTube channel, so that's easily 
uh, searchable. And um, I wanted to, of course, leave you with my contact information. I'm happy to answer any questions if they arise at the end of this session. Uh, but as I know we're limited on time, we can. Um, I'm certainly happy to take any questions um, after the fact, and this is how you can contact me. So thank you. I appreciate your time, and I will turn it back over to Meg. Hi, um, I think that um, Becky is actually going to, yep, uh, Wes is up next. We're all ready to start part two of our presentation from the Pennsylvania State Archives. Take it away, Wes. All right. Hi, I'm Wes Decker. I'll move this slide here. Okay. I'm Wes Decker, an archivist at the Pennsylvania State Archives. Uh, today, I'm going to be discussing our efforts in digitizing videos at the PA State Archives. Um, I'm just going to go over the common videotape formats that we have in our collections that we've worked with. Uh, we have a lot, but I'll just focus on the main ones. Um, they include uh, three-quarter inch matic tapes, uh, Betacam tapes, including SP, SX, and digital Betacam, along with VHS tapes. Those are the primary formats that we've been able to digitize in house. Uh, most of the tape decks and accessory equipment that we've used in the digitization process were obtained through our partnership with Commonwealth Media Services. Uh, Commonwealth Media Services is within the uh, Pennsylvania state government and provides multimedia services for the state agencies. Many of the videos that we have in our collections were filmed by Commonwealth Media Services. Uh, so with the equipment, nowadays they don't have any use for those old decks. And so we were able to obtain them because uh, we certainly have a use for them. Um, we need these decks to help preserve uh, old analog tapes that we have in our collections and make them accessible to the public. Uh, we did also have a few old tape players at the archives that we were able to make use of as well, but primarily the decks and any accessory equipment were provided to us through Commonwealth Media Services. Uh, however, there are some common formats that we have that we cannot convert in house. That includes 8 millimeter and 16 millimeter reels. Uh, we need to send these reels to an outside vendor for digitization. Okay, now I'm going to go through some of the old analog tapes and their decks to give you a visual of what they look like in case you weren't familiar with them. Uh, these are three quarter inch pneumatic tapes. Uh, this is a smaller version. Uh, we do have the larger versions as well, and we can play them as well in house. Uh, this is one of the pneumatic tape decks, the Sony VO9600. And this is another one, the Sony VO5850. For the Betacam tapes, we have the Betacam SB. We have a lot of those in our collections. Also, the Betacam SX and the digital Betacam tape. Uh, for the tape decks, uh, the Sony DNW A7 5 Sony DVW A500, and the Sony MSW M2000. And finally, the VHS tapes, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. Um, and there's a one of the decks, uh, the Sony SBO 1630 and the Sony SBO 5800. Um, in addition to the tape decks, uh, there are some accessories that we have used to assist us in the digitization project. Uh, we have two iMacs that are connected to the tape decks. It is through these iMacs that we operate the whole process. Uh, we have a Blackmagic Studio Video Hub Writer and Blackmagic H264 Pro Recorder. Uh, for the Betacam tape decks, you can run the videos from them into the writer, which transfer, tra transports them through the recorder into the IMAX. Uh, for the Umatic and VHS tapes, we also send those videos from their decks through the Blackmagic Mini Converter 
analog to SDI device and a time-based corrector before routing them into the IMAX. And just give you some visuals of our accessories. Uh, the, this is one of the IMAX. Uh, these IMAX are really nice to use when um, digitizing video and audio. Um, if you can, I would make use of them. Uh, this is our Video Hub Writer. Uh, this is the uh, Pro Recorder. And the Black Magic Mini Converter Analog SDI. And also a time based corrector that is useful in helping uh, stabilize videos. We also use different applications in the process. The applications include the Black Magic Studio Video Hub. Blackmagic Media Express, QuickTime, and Adobe Premiere Pro. Here is an image of the Blackmagic Studio Video Hub. Uh, this helped us connect the IMAX to the tape decks. Uh, this is an image of the Blackmagic Media Express player. This is the application that we use to capture the videos. This is the QuickTime player. QuickTime is useful in the post-digitization process. Uh, we provide some minor editing of a video, like trimming off the ends, such as the color bars. We also will use it to select a poster frame that will serve as a thumbnail in our digital asset management system that we upload the videos into once complete. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And finally, Adobe Premiere Pro, this is the work area. Um, it's not necessary, but it has been very helpful in some serious situations like getting the lips synchronized with the words. Uh, Premiere Pro has not been used often, but I think it is very useful to have. Okay, now once it's our digital asset management system, uh, once they're digitized, the videos will be uploaded into a system known as VideoBank. It is maintained in partnership with the Video Bank Digital Asset Management Company and Commonwealth Media Services. Uh, right now, it's an internal access, so we're not providing public access. Um, the, once the original MOV file is created the, through the conversion process, we will um, upload it into Video Bank using an application that was created internally with the assistance of Commonwealth Media Services. And during that uploading process, the M4V access file is created. When the uploading is complete, the MOV and M4V files will appear on the same asset page within the system for that particular video. And after the upload is complete, uh, staff will provide descriptive metadata for the video. Examples include the archival series number, the event, the date, a brief description of the video, uh, the location of what particular governor's administration that the video might have been associated with, any relevant state agencies, uh, the individuals represented, and keywords, length, and the format. Those are some examples of the metadata that we will provide. Okay, uh, to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this is the main search page for VideoBank. Uh, here is a snip of what the VideoBank search results look like. Here you will see the thumbnails, and these thumbnails were created for using the QuickTime application once the videos were complete in, with digitization. Okay, so, all right, um, this is a uh, screenshot of one of the asset pages in VideoBank. Uh, this is of the uh, 1993 Pennsylvania Farm Show. I'm just gonna, and um, when you open up the page, uh, what you will see is the video starting to play on the 
five side. Um, I'm going to move to the next slide. You'll see a clear image of this. Um, what you'll see here is while it's playing, it's currently showing the butter sculpture of that farm shell. Um, and on the right side, you'll see a portion of the metadata for the asset. Um, and there's more metadata on here. Uh, you just have to scroll down using the bar on the right hand side. Um, and just for some background information, this asset is from uh, the Governor Robert P. Casey video collection. Uh, that is one of the uh, major video collections that we have digitized in HEX. Uh, there was a lot of tapes to go through, uh, but we did it. Um, so that's what one of the major things that we've worked on. Um, the tapes that we, from that collection in particular, were primarily UMATIC and Betacam SP. So, All right. Okay, this is a clip from the same asset page. Um, what you see here are the MOV and M4V files. Uh, you'll also see the MPEG file. That's an old access file that we no longer use. Uh, right now, the M4V file is the access file. And so if a patron were to make a request for this particular video, we would provide them in most cases with the M4V. Okay, um, some closing advice. Uh, partnerships are important. Uh, Commonwealth Media Services has been an immensely helpful partner for us. Uh, it would be hard to do all this without them. They supplied a lot of the equipment and have provided us with a lot of technical support over the years we've been working with them. Um, also, I'll say attention to detail is very important when processing the videos. Uh, this includes checking the videos for quality and applying the descriptive metadata. That, to do that, you need to be accurate, concise, and clear with how you uh, describe the video. And that marks my end of the presentation, my part of the presentation. So you can reach me at wedecker at pa.gov. Uh, thank you. Okay, Marie, you're next up. Hi. Thank you to Wes Decker and Brian Rooney, or Daniel Rooney, for their presentations. Let me advance the slide here. My name is Marie Balogorski, and I'm an archivist at the PA State Archives in Harrisburg, PA. In addition, in addition to digitizing analog audio and video at the archives, I also work with digital born governor's records, both photo and video assets. Here's an overview of the topics that I will cover today, the identification and prioritization of media, and the analog audio formats that we have been digitizing at the PA State Archives, which include vinyl records, magnetic tape reels, and audio cassette tapes. I will also discuss the equipment and software that we use. I'll show some examples of reel-to-reel -reel track formats and tape repair, and I will also discuss ingesting an asset and processing digital assets with descriptive metadata in our digital asset management system. Thorough but simple inventories of your collection can be a foundation for the professional management of your audio collections, as well as a service to your users. In 2019, I created an inventory of audiovisual media in the PA State Archive collections, and I compiled the inventory by searching our online finding aids. I created an, uh, I created an Excel spreadsheet where I compiled information that included the record title for the item, the record group or manuscript group series number, the container's description, location, and barcode number, the item's media type format, the size, speed, and length, the generation, which clarifies whether it's the original or a duplicate, and other notes, including if it's copyrighted or confidential. 
Of course, the scope of your inventory will depend on the size and contents of your collection or project. Carrier deterioration and technical obsolescence make reformatting to digital files the only way to ensure future access to legacy, sound form, legacy format sound recordings. As older audio media is becoming obsolete, it may, it may be a good idea to prioritize digitizing magnetic reel-to-reel -reel tapes and audio cassette tapes. Final records are a more stable format. As you may know that acetate film can be prone to vinegar syndrome, the same is true for acetate magnetic tapes. Also, sticky shed syndrome and flaking can happen with polyester magnetic tapes. Sticky shed syndrome is a condition created by the deterioration of the binders in a magnetic tape due to the absorption of moisture. All audio should be stored vertically in low temperature and low humidity environments. Other things to consider while prioritizing media to digitize, what are the rights of the content? Is it copyrighted? Is the content unique? Is there enough storage capacity? And is it possible to digitize in-house? The picture on the left in this slide is of a reel-to-reel -reel audio tape that contains a recording of a musical performance by Ola Bell Reed at the 1967 Pennsylvania Junior Historians Convention. The picture on the right is a record of Milton Schaap's theme song, Stand Up, Fight for the Things You Stand For. The theme song was written by Schaap for his campaign when he was running for governor of Pennsylvania. When starting a new collection or project, it's important to assess the physical condition of the media and determine the type and quantity of media, media in each container. When looking at each item, you may find that the speed is not, trying to advance the slide here. <laughs> when looking at each item, you, you will want to know um, what speed it was recorded at. It may be 15, seven and a half inches or three and three quarter inches per second. Also, if it's a reel-to-reel -reel tape, you will want to know if it was recorded at quarter track, half track stereo, or mono track format. Most tapes are not labeled with this information. I will talk more about this later when I show our reel-to-reel -reel player that we have at the State Archives. The photo on the right in this slide is a recording of an oral history interview with Lou Sesher, a man who worked on boats most of his life. On the next slide, you can see uh, this tape reel in more detail. This oral history interview was conducted by Dave Walton with interviewee Lou Sesher on April 28, 29th, 1967 at the Pennsylvania Federation of Junior Historians meeting. The date, content, and speed of the tape are all specified on the box. The length of the recording was discovered when digitizing the tape. Here are two audio cassette tapes from Record Group 309.15, Milton Schaap's personal papers. The first tape is Milton Schaap's copy of the Bicentennial speeches at Independence Hall. The second tape pictured here is an oral history interview. Oral historian Corinne Krauss interviewed former Governor Milton Schaap on February 11th and 12th in 1979. This is Milton Schaap's copy of the interview, and you can see that it's part 16. Here are two records, also known as LPs or long playing records, from Record Group 13.204, Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission's Division of Pennsylvania Folklore, audio records. The two educational programs are The Trial of William Penn and The History of Pensbury Manor. Here's another record from the same collection, The Songs and Ballads of the Anthracite Miners. We were able to scan and ingest a PDF copy of the brochure that came with this album. The brochure contains song, song lyrics and the origins of each song in Pennsylvania. This is the record player that we have for playback and digitizing at the archives. It uses a USB cable to connect to the computer for the audio connection into Audacity, which is the recording software that we use to digitize. Audacity is an open source and free software. This record player plays 33 and a third, 45 and 78 RPM records. 
If you're looking for an inexpensive option to digitize records, this record player has worked well for us. Here's the Tascam A580 cassette player that we use with the Focusrite interface. The Tascam CD A580 combines the cassette recorder, CD player, and USB flash drive recorder and player into a rack mountable unit. The Tascam cassette player uses an RCA to quarter inch cable to connect the Tascam outputs to the Focusrite inputs. The Focusrite interface uses a USB cable to connect to Audacity on the computer. Here is our Tascam two-track reel-to-reel player. We also use the Focusrite interface with this machine, and it uses the same RCA to quarter-inch cable to connect the Tascam outputs to the Focusrite inputs. This machine reads two-track, also known as half-track stereo recordings on quarter-inch tape. Here you can see the RCA outputs circled in blue, the speed selection is on the left, circled in pink. It, you can choose high or low, and high is seven and a half inches per second. Low speed is three and three quarter inches per second. The stop, play, fast forward, and rewind controls are circled in green. Our two-track test stand machine can read mono and half-track tapes for digitization, but it cannot read quarter-track reels. Here you can see what half-track stereo looks like. There's channel one, channel two, separated by a guard band in the middle. None of the audio reels that I've digitized have been labeled with the reel-to-reel -reel format. That is, if they are mono track, half track, which is also two tracks, or quarter track, also known as four track stereo. I'm only able to identify what, what type of track format it is by listening and recording the audio on the tape reel into Audacity. The quarter track audio reels in our collections will have to be outsourced for digitization since we don't have a reel to reel machine with quarter track heads that can read the quarter track tape reels. We also found that we will have to send out some other media, including over 16, oversized 16 inch LPs, and we also have a large quantity of autograph records. There's a link at the bottom of this slide for the Association for Recorded Sound Collections YouTube video. I will also share the link at the end of the presentation. The pictures of the track formats are from this video. Here you can see what quarter track and mono track looks like. Quarter track creates two sets of stereo or dual mono tracks, one pair on each quote unquote side of a quarter inch tape, essentially four tracks, but used in pairs as opposed to all four tracks in one direction. The L and R here represent the left and right channels of our Tascam, two-track Tascam machine. So this is what happens when our two-track machine tries to read quarter track. The stereo head's left channel will read channel one and channel two reverse, and the right channel reads channel two and channel one reverse. So simultaneously, there's a forward and reverse signal coming into each channel, which cannot be separated in Audacity. This is why we cannot digitize quarter track reel to reel tapes on a two track machine. Here you can also see mono track as compared to half track on the right of the slide. It's ideal to look for a reel to reel player that has that can also play half track stereo and quarter track formats so that you'll be able to digitize both of these formats. Here's some pictures of tape repair. In the left picture here, the cassette tape became unthreaded from the spool inside of the tape and it was tangled in the machine. I was able to do a tape surgery on the cassette tape. I taped the magnetic tape back onto the spool and put the tape back together. I was able to digitize four or five tapes after fixing the tapes where this type of breakage happened. Here's what Audacity looks like. You will need to download it on your computer to use for digitization. We set our specifications to record at a sample rate of 96 kilohertz and a bit depth of 24 bit. And we export the preservation master as a WAV file. Here you can see 
some examples of our file names. Um, we, the file names when we upload um, assets into video bank, we use the series number, the container number, if needed, the item number, description and date. We ingest our WAV files with a photo of, of the audio media to use as a thumbnail pick in our digital asset management system. As Wes mentioned, we have a partnership with another state agency, Commonwealth Media Services, and we use video bank for our digital asset management system. Also, as Wes mentioned, Commonwealth Media Services designed an app for us to use to ingest our audio and video files to video bank. The app uploads the preservation master WAV file and it generates an MP3 access copy file from the WAV file. We can also add other photos of the physical item or PDF to the asset and video bank. Here you can see an example of an asset and video bank. And here are the files associated with this asset and the matrix here at the bottom. We have descriptive metadata into video bank for the asset, including the series number, title, date, description of asset, the place or location if known, and the individuals represented if known. We also specify the audio or video format, length of duration, the media format type, which would either be audio, video, or photo. And we also mark if it's confidential or copyrighted in the metadata. Please let me know if there are any questions, and thank you. Thank you so much, Marie and Wes and Dan and me. Um, I really appreciated those presentations, and we have gotten a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and I encourage anybody else who has questions for any of our presenters to enter them in the chat. I'd also like to invite our speakers to put their video cameras back on um, so you can be as if at a conference table and people can ask you questions. So the first question is, what advice or guidance do you have on keeping our analog video decks maintained and running okay? It's virtually impossible to find a local source to get video decks serviced and repaired. How are you all handling that? Well, I'll jump in and say that um, I concur that it's extremely difficult to uh, to to keep a variety of different decks um, in working order. There are uh, every year there are seemingly fewer vendors um, capable of handling this, and depending on where you are geographically, that can be an even bigger uh, challenge if you have to be shipping you know material out to uh, or decks out to. Vendor, I should say, to do that. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of um, maintenance that can be done in house. Um, basic cleaning and calibration is important. Um, so I would, you know, certainly encourage that if you have, um, if you have, even with a relatively modest budget, you can get some supplies to support that work. Um, but otherwise, you know, you should be looking for available vendors um, that can support it. And depending on the size of the collection and what you're trying to accomplish, um, you know, you might make very different decisions about that. I would also just add that some um, some decks that we have, we, we actually have a, at NARA in our AV lab, uh, we have uh, sort of, we call it the graveyard, but it's not really a graveyard because it's um, things can go in, decks can go in and out of service over the years as we need them or don't need them. So we're very hesitant to get rid of anything. Um, and some formats that we've had a large surplus of, like VHS and Ematics, um, we can use those for, for spare parts um, that we can utilize equipment often. So it's kind of a variety of all these different strategies that we use. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, uh, we do work with Commonwealth Media Services. They do provide some assistance when with cleaning the decks because they're more familiar with it because that's their area of expertise. Um, but yeah, we like Daniel says, we also keep old decks that we no longer use for parts in case we need them. Um, and I would also say, I mean, just if you can, Get the stuff converted because <laughs> you know these decks are old now, and so we are sort of running out of time a bit. So, but yeah, 
we do have some assistance with maintenance, so it's it's hard to get though. But yeah. It sounds like that's a common problem for everybody. Um, John Keller at the Clinton Library had asked this question, and it sounds like they also keep backup decks um, and a, a boneyard for, <laughs> for parts. So we have one other question. Um, Dan, did you mention a NARA link with the digitized file specs, and is there a way of sharing that maybe in the chat or afterwards? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to. The, the, um, all of the specs that were included in my slides, is um, those are actually part of a larger NARA series of web pages that NARA has published information about all of its uh, digitization specs. So I'm, um, I'm happy to share those links. Um, let me see if I, am I able to drop them in the chat or? You should be able to. Look for the everyone option. And then everyone will be able to see what you enter if you see the chat box. And while Dan is doing that, I have one additional question, which is if there's an issue that really keeps you up at night, what, what is it? What are you most worried about in your, in your work? I guess I'll start. Uh, to go off what I just said, the deck not working, <laughs> I'm afraid that if it doesn't work, we'll never get it to work again. So that is a concern. That's one thing. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, for me, yeah. Oh, for me, I think it's if our real to real tape player stops working, we probably won't be able to get another one for I don't know how long. So um just yeah, that the equipment keeps working. We can keep digitizing. Thank you. That makes sense. Dan did just pop some links into the chat. So if people are interested in following up on that, please consult the chat. And Dan, do you have anything to say about what your nightmares are about? Among my many nightmares, um, <laughs> when it when it comes to the collections, um, yeah, I mean, I echo the the equipment comments, um, but also uh, those rare formats that there just is no existing equipment for. Um, and you're dealing with the simultaneous problem of um, the deterioration of the media type itself and the unavailability of any kind of playback equipment. So we have a handful of examples of uh, actually some rather large collections at NARA, if anybody's familiar with Bemabox uh, audio discs, for example. Um, that is one that kind of keeps me up at night. That's a World War II era format that was used by the government for monitored radio broadcasts. Um, and we have a lot that have never been uh, uh, transferred analog or digital. Um, and they are, you know, actively deteriorating. There's another, uh, there's another World War II era format called um, hammer tape or recordograph machines and uh, also used by the government extensively. Um, so those are those are those are like the two pronged nightmare of not having anything available to play it back on and an actively deteriorating format. Thank you. That's enough to keep everybody up at night. So at this point, I'd like to thank you and pass control back over to Barbara to wrap us up for the day. But I'd also like to invite both Dan and Maria and Wes not both, all three of you, to put in the chat just a note about what your most popular collections are. I know this was all about preservation, but I think it'd be really fun to highlight some of the things that your users really love to see. And with that, I'll turn control back over to Barbara. Hey, thanks, Meg, and thanks, thanks, thank you all so much for those great presentations. Uh, the, the thing I really picked up was I like to phrase tape surgery. So thank you for sharing that one, Marie. Um, Becky, would you mind giving us the next slide? And I think this is your slide, Meg, with your news, a little bit of news from NARA. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. This is, uh, I, I really actually don't want to take up the time, but we do have a relatively new website where you can keep track of a large span of types of things going on at NARA. So I just want to make sure everybody knows about this. It's archives.gov slash news. And there you can find out about public programs and educational programs, our new social media strategy, which has just been released, and a wide variety of other things. I'd also like to say that um, the National Archives Rotunda, where the 
Constitution, Declaration, and Bill of Rights are all displayed is reopening to the public for a few hours on Saturdays starting this coming Saturday. So it's good news for us. Thank you. And also from that uh, page, you can subscribe and get uh, press releases from NARA. I, I get those. So those are really useful if you're interested in getting NARA news more regularly. May I have the next slide, please, Becky? And we know we're over time. There are just a couple of things we wanted to point out for you, those of you who are here. Um, next week, we do have another webinar sponsored by Coast State Electronic Records Initiative. We're going to introduce, if you haven't already seen it, Coast's new publication about managing government records at home while you're teleworking. So we're going to introduce that publication and also talk some about some of the issues that you may have when you're working at home and how you need to maintain government records and how you need to help your agencies maintain their records properly when their employees are not in the office. We do have a couple of extra member webinars this year thanks to our National Endowment for the Humanities CARES grant. We're going to feature just a couple of our state archives just to show what each state archives does in October. Uh, on October 22nd, we've got California and Louisiana, and then in November, we have Utah and D.C., so we hope you'll join us. And we did have a question in the chat. Will we have the recording soon? Yes, we should have it. It usually takes a couple of days to process, but Becky Juleson, our IT coordinator, is going to try to speed it up since um, tomorrow and, and Saturday are Electronic Records Day. Um, may I have the next slide, please? That is, um, as I mentioned, tomorrow is Electronic Records Day. Usually we celebrate it on 1010, uh, but 1010 is Saturday. So we're going to do some things on Saturday, but actually we're going to do the majority of our Electronic Records Day social media work tomorrow. So we hope those hope you'll join us on Twitter and Facebook and share things. Uh, with each other about what you're doing for Electronic Records Day. Oh, and Meg is saying Dan is in Vanity Fair. I missed that. So, all right. <laughs> we all need to go. We, have, we need to click on that and read about Dan and Vanity Fair with the Apollo 11 recordings. Um, and just one more slide. We appreciate your patience. We have an evaluation for you so you can give us some feedback on this webinar. We'd like to know what other topics you're interested in uh, that COSA and NARA could do together or that COSA can do or that NARA might want to do um, if we sense send them some information. So just let us know how we did today. And um, I know I will fill it out and give this like a 10 out of 10 because I really learned a lot and I love to see those pictures of the umatic machines <laughs> and everything. So we really appreciate our speakers and appreciate Meg for moderating for us. And thank, thank you all for coming. And please do fill out our evaluation and have a good afternoon. Thank you.